Hello everyone and welcome back to the Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. This week we'll be diving into the microscopic structure of materials through elastic diffraction. But today our goal is to go over a mathematical concept called the Fourier series and how it'll be useful in this class. Okay, recall last week that we determined that any local crystal property, such as the atom's position or the local charge density, is invariant under the translation vector t. So suppose we have a 1D chain of atoms with spacing A. In this case, let's just approximate our charge density as a wave like this, with charge buildup centered over each atom as so. So this may be a little disconcerting at first because we may not have an exact equation for n of x. But because we have something periodic, we can build it using a sum of other periodic functions, like sines and cosines. This sum is what we call a Fourier series where we're summing over only positive values of the integer p. So this makes our Fourier space a set of discrete points where the allowed points are associated with waves that are consistent with the translational symmetry of the lattice. So that's a big claim to make. How would you test that? Well, that's easy. We just need to replace x with x plus a and see if we get back our original n of x. Now using some trig trickery, we can go from this to a more simplified expression. Lo and behold, we get back n of x. But what about these cp and sp coefficients? What do they tell us? Yeah, so in later videos this week, we'll pay special attention to these. But in general, these Fourier coefficients tell us a particular wave's contribution to the whole n. Also in later videos, we'll use complex exponentials instead of sines and cosines for our Fourier series where the coefficient is allowed to be complex, and we sum over all values of p. No way, that doesn't seem right. If our coefficients can be complex, then there's a chance that our n of x could be, and an imaginary charge density doesn't really make sense. Yeah, you're right. And in order to ensure that n of x is real, we just need to put a constraint on our coefficients. Page 28 of Cattell, version 8, goes through and proves this, if any of you at home are curious. So in short, a Fourier series is a way to construct something complicated with periodic functions that are easy to work with, like sines and cosines or complex exponentials. We'll be using them quite a bit in diffraction, so it'd be good for you to get a good grasp on them. To really drive Fourier series and Fourier coefficients home, let's take a quick look at this applet. So I can construct an arbitrary periodic function, say a square wave. And then we can see how many terms we want to approximate this function with. Let's start with just two terms. Well, that's not a good fit. Nope. And down below, we can see a graphical representation of the magnitude of the Fourier coefficients. Clicking on each one, we can see the individual contributions. Let's increase the number of terms then and see if we get a better fit to the square wave. Cool, so now we see that the fit is much better and the Fourier coefficients decay away. As we move to shorter and shorter wavelengths, each makes a smaller adjustment to improve the fit. And again, we can visualize these individual contributions to the Fourier series. If you want to play around with this, there's an applet on Blackboard that you can download. As always, here are some questions to consider at home. First, we gave you what the Fourier series looks like in 1D. How would you extend equation 3.5 to a crystal with three dimensions? Second, where is this Fourier space? It might help to think about units in this case. Third, does changing the basis change which terms in the Fourier series are allowed? Thanks for watching today's Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. The rest of the week, Eric and I will dive into the math behind experimentally measuring crystal structures. See you then.